the biggest risk as a society we face is the risk of digital feudalism. AI is a way to buy time so we can do more as humans. So we have such an important technology piece that is controlled by so few. I mean, that is scary because these are not elected officials. These are relatively unknown members, and that's something I think is it, super risky. That's the future we have uh -huh. if we don't look at how to bring back or how to decentralize or bring the sovereignty to the people that actually use AI versus well, people that build AI. All right, we're here with the co-founder of Akash, Greg Osuri. Greg, good to see you, man. Great to see you, Zach, it's as always. It's exciting because as we've already kind of talked about Akash for a while here, one of our former crypto projects of the year from 23, we're back at Mainnet at the conference here. And you guys have really grown quite a bit. I mean, before it was just kind of like theoretical what could happen if you decentralize cloud compute. Now you guys are really hitting your stride. So what's kind of the new metrics we should be taking a look at when it comes to Akash? So I think like just applications deployed tend to be the tail metric, right? And so this quarter to quarter, I think got a 50% gain uh -huh. in applications deployed. That just tells you the amount of you know, uh, awareness that we have gained overall and the type of applications too, that tend to be a lot more qualitative. Uh, a lot of exciting apps like Venice AI, which I use quite a lot every day. Yeah. And I'm really excited to, to be using the products deployed on Akash daily uh, myself, right? And finding product market fit there and uh, also seeing NVIDIA, you know, using Akash quite a lot. Uh, I, I believe uh, Akash is the only uh, decentralized protocol NVIDIA actually uses and NVIDIA users use. Yeah. Uh, so it's really good to see both penetration not only in the decentralized um, ecosystem but in like as centralized as it gets with, with NVIDIA being the largest company in the world using decentralized uh, networks is, is, is fascinating. Well, I think that's kind of where we're at now too. It's like, you know, uh, so much of what we had talked about in prior cycles in terms of excitement around crypto projects was like, oh, well, you know, number go up or how does this work? And now we're kind of accelerated to the point where like, okay, what's the utility here? And back then it was kind of a bit of a meme, but we're hitting real utility. Um, you talked about some of the use cases for Akash. I mean, how have those kind of grown organically? in terms of people being like, okay, decentralized compute's important for not just AI, but also everything else. Oh my God, so, like sitting in Austin, my home, and being virtual, you don't really realize how popular Akash is outside like the crypto circles. I was on Capitol Hill the other day talking to one of the financial, one of the top committees uh, for uh, trade and commerce. Uh, this is a company that has jurisdiction over AI. Yeah. And uh, introduced myself and Greg with Akash and and they were like, yeah, we look, we, we know Akash. Akash is like the intersection of deep in and AI. I'm like, I was blown away that they actually know the terms. So yeah. this is these are legislators. These are people writing the laws, you know, setting policy. So Akash is not only like popular in the crypto circles, but outside of crypto, people either know of Akash, people are excited, and a lot of times, because Akash's use case is so direct and so um, obvious in terms of like what we do, yeah, we're disrupting an arcade industry that needs to be disrupted because this industry built moats that are very hard to break yep. and using decentralization is a perfect way, right? Like, So that gets into like, I guess even us thinking about why we're doing what we're doing, right? And I think there's a lot of parallels uh, going back to the history, the corporate history of America, all the way from the progressive era, beginning in the uh, mid 18, 1800s to what happened with Standard Oil. Yeah. You know, if you look at how railroads like started off in the mid 1800s and how they effectively became the de facto industry in America, uh, and that led to a lot of experimentation, cartelization, and oligopolization, and all these like nasty things that you hear with corporations today that eventually led to Standard Oil, which became a monopoly, right? Huh? It was the uh, largest like antitrust case uh, in the history, right? It's so popular that Theodore Roosevelt ran on the platform of breaking, breaking up the Standard Oil 
Uh, so it's so crazy in America alone yeah. how corporate control, when it gets overly centralized, can lead to outcomes that we have to write legislation, we have to write laws to break down, and how crypto can really solve these heavy corruption that happens with like corporations getting large, right? Well, I think so, that that's, that's important too, especially in 2024, because a railway is one thing. I think people understand that and can you know wrap their brains around it. But when it comes to AI and decentralization of computing power, it's a little bit more abstract. I mean, what does that introduce in terms of risks of regulators maybe not getting this right uh, and being swayed by the incumbents that exist already? The biggest risk as a society we face is the risk of digital feudalism. So if you remember, we work very hard to break away from these feudalistic societies where the few people, the lords, effectively had political favors from people that they support to, uh, to, to hoarding of critical resources for us peasants uh, uh, that have to effectively beg or plead or do what it takes to, to get access to basic resources, right? And that's what's happening with AI. AI is, is augmenting intelligence, is really extending how we think and how we work. AI is a way to buy time so we can do more as humans, yeah. right? So we have such an important technology piece that is controlled by so few. I mean, fortunately we're seeing the breakdown of open AI, but you know, we all saw what happened when, you know, five people on OpenAI's board can effectively control the most powerful AI in the world for however long, for a few days. Yeah. That is scary because these are not elected officials. These are relatively unknown members serving a private corporation can control such a powerful AI. Imagine how fragile we are, right? So yeah. there's absolutely zero transparency into how these models are trained. Uh, who paid for the training so we understand who eventually gets to benefit from the training and yeah. are we as humans, are we the product or are we the consumer? Right? Yeah. It's very unclear right now with AI and, and a bigger question is what happens when we finally discover AGI, right? Like, because there's no incentive for the individual that has AGI to share it with the world because what happens when you have the most powerful AI, natural tendency is for you to keep it to yourself and yep. benefit the, uh, out of it versus sharing the technology. And that's something I think is, is super risky. Uh, that's, that's the future we have uh -huh. if we don't look at how to bring back or how to decentralize uh, or, or bring the sovereignty to, to the people that actually use AI. Well, versus people that build AI. Well, you're wearing a shirt that says "Come and take it," and it's a you know it's a GPU there, and I think that that's important just in terms of people who might not be in the industry understanding that to really decentralize it, you need to decentralize the stack, you need to decentralize right. the base power of it all, which is access to computing power in the world of AI. Right. And that's what you guys are doing. But I, I mean, like as a failure point, if regulators start to say we're gonna we're gonna control who actually gets access to that, it's a oh. dystopian future, but. Is there legitimate fears around that? Right, so regulators shouldn't over-regulate to a point that you don't make progress, right? Uh, over-regulation is a big risk because, you know, if we have to put brakes on how much computation power we need or if you have to get permission from the government to train AI or that leads to corruption, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Proven over and over again throughout history that every time you have uh, government intervention in free market forces, you just either kill the industry or you end up in a uh, in a situation where regulatory arbitrage could happen, meaning people that have the capacity the to incumbents. comply and, yeah. the, and the capital to comply tend to win, and people, normal people that are innovators that don't may not necessarily have the same level of capital or, or the know how to deal with regulators lose, and that's not a future we want, right? Yep. So, uh, fortunately, my conversations with legislators uh, so far have been very fruitful, and there's a general consensus amongst policymakers that AI is, unless there's concrete damage, uh, AI will not be regulated, but once there's concrete damage, they're going to take a very low touch, yep. but very fast uh, 
uh, reaction. So there's a, last week I was spending a lot of time with, with policymakers, both across across the board, all the way from de uh, Department of Defense to, to State, State Department and, and a whole, you know, uh, range of folks. But so 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 now there's a, a, an effort to do uh, risk mitigation through scenario planning yeah. versus putting premature uh, regulation on top and blocking AI, which I am a big fan of, right? So as part of the risk mitigation plan is how do you break down power structures yeah. to a point where we have transparency so we can react quicker, right? So we have transparency as to who exactly provides the power, provides the data, who writes the models, how can we create, uh, how do we think the AI is going to evolve? Is it going to be one company that's going to build AGI? Or it's going to be multiple open source models that all mix together and evolve in a organic manner, just yeah. like how humanity has evolved, right? There are a lot of parallels. If you think about how Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthals and- For sure. It's a lot of, there are different types of human beings that mixed and, 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 and uh, actually stopped evolving and a whole lot of things that happened. <laughs> so it's not like one sector human beings kind of took dominance, it's a lot of mixture that is very uh, interesting if you trace back to 72,000 years of humanity, right? Yeah, and I, I feel like uh, some of the stuff when you apply it now in today's world for, I guess, you know, Akash specifically, talk to me about some of those metrics and how far they've grown just because of usage, right, in terms of you know, we were talking with Cosmo Jang from Pantera, one of the projects that they're obviously kind of attached to and, and promote. Uh, a lot of people in uh, deep in investing talk about Akash consistently. Um, but when it comes to what you are actually watching now in those metrics, it might not seem super, super large in relative to like other SaaS products out there, but what does the growth venture look like, the roadmap look like for Greg Asturian Squad? Yeah, so it's about the growth, right? Where we are, where we are now. So last year when we did the interview, uh, I think the daily spend was $500 a day. Now it's $5,000 a day. It literally 10 x yeah. over a year. I mean, and that's a remarkable growth and you want that exponential. It, it grew by a whole, whole exponent, right? So and that's the kind of like growth we want to see in early stage and we are very happy with that growth. But I think we can grow faster. And the way we're going to grow faster is by tapping into the mainstream community uh, and removing the friction, uh, the barriers that effectively prevent a traditional AI user to use Akash. So that comes in several ways. Obviously, uh, a big challenge right now for Akash is getting access to AKG tokens, uh, having a crypto wallet, and all these, you know, education a, a user is required to even use basic functionality. We're removing that, we're launching a product next week that'll that hopefully change all these, uh, these uh, reboots barriers, right? But also like going beyond just removing the barrier into understanding what the workflow looks like for AI engineering. Yep. So today an engineer uh, is not necessarily an infrastructure expert. And there are machine learning experts, there are mathematicians, there are researchers that are focused on machine learning problems rather than how do I construct a Docker container or how do I deploy this thing or how do I run a shell command, right? So we have a new product that we're working on that reduces the need for a machine learning engineer to incur the overhead to get productive. Yeah. So today, if you were to run Llama, for example, Llama 3.1 or 3.2, rather, but 3.1 Same uh, one is the meta, the meta open the meta source. The meta is yeah. the most advanced open source model. It's, researchers love this product, and it's a big model, it's a 405B parameter model. And uh, the, the weights are about uh, close, to a ter close to a terabyte size. Yeah. So just to download the weights and uh, you know, load those weights into this massive H100 clusters, which are not cheap, takes about three to five hours by the time you can get productive. Uh, consider, and you need the knowledge, right? Yep. So that's a long time for a machine learning use, engineer to use Akash. With our new product, that time will be cut short from five hours to 15 seconds. So those are some of the things that we're doing uh, to get a uh, growth faster because the opportunity is incredible. I mean, today, you know, we barely uh, scratch the surface. I mean, yeah. AI is still a very niche field. Uh, even though I use AI 
uh, pretty much daily uh, on multiple occasions, right? I think every three to four hours I use AI, but I want to cut that to every hour. Yeah. And cut that to every minute, right? Because that's how we're going. And most people don't use AI the way I use AI. And because it's expensive, it's, uh, the inference cost is still very high, the inference speeds are still very low. Uh, so we got to solve the, the inference cost problem uh, for the globe to attach. And I'm anxious about the Apple's AI introduction and also excited, right? Anxious because a billion phones coming online with AI, I don't think we have the infrastructure to scale. Yeah. Not, not a car, I think the globe doesn't have infrastructure to scale. Uh, for context, NVIDIA makes about 750,000 H100s a year. Yep. We need one H100 per person. Uh, there's about 8 billion H100s <laughs> to have every second uh, connectivity, right? Roughly yeah. one billion. So, as of the globe, doesn't have the infrastructure to address, to bring everybody online, right? So, and this technology evolves so fast that H100 now will go out of fashion in two years. Yeah. So every two years we need new chips to replace the old chips. And uh, so the opportunity is so massive, I think, and also the energy needs to catch up, right? Like, yeah. uh, I think the prediction now is by 2030, 20% of US uh, electricity production will be consumed by AI. So we don't have infrastructure to even power that you know, uh, power requirement. We need to build nuclear reactors and, and fascinating to see how decentralized technologies are powering. Yeah. So you can easily see a world where you have decentralized uh, data centers powered by Akash, you have decentralized energy grids powered by daylight and a whole lot of projects now that can trade power and then a decentralized wireless and and uh, 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 and uh, you know bandwidth marketplaces that are coming up now. Yeah. Uh, uh, powering the future that, that we're excited about. That's what I'm saying, though. It's yeah. exciting to see it. it. It doesn't happen overnight, and so to be back at the conference with you and kind of checking in on where things are, you know, it's day by day incremental growth. But then you kind of step back and say, "Wow, look at kind of how much is really being built here." So it's really fun to watch. It's and fascinating the growth of AI, like so. Like, the amount of power we need, I believe is growing by half a motor, half a, uh, like half an exponent every year, uh -huh. right? Order magnitude, right? So, so today, the GPT-4 was trained, I believe, on a uh, 100 megawatt capacity data center. And so that grows to about 50 megawatt capacity for the, the newer model. And then the next year is 250, right? Uh, and then next year is 1.2 gigawatt. So when you get to 1.2 gigawatt, that means it's a nuclear reactor. Nuclear reactor produces one gigawatt. Yeah. We can't do solar because solar is like, for every square mile of solar, it produces 2.2 gigawatts. And we just don't have enough storage Land capacity, mass. right, for yeah. solar. So it is going to be nuclear. And Microsoft just bought a nuclear reactor in, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Oracle is building nuclear reactors in uh, Texas. Um, we are in the nuclear, I mean, nuclear kind of died, but now it's coming back. <laughs> and there are banks obviously financing nuclear, right? Yep. And so it's an, such an opportunity right now to decentralize power, right? So it is kind of crazy how fast we're building. Yep. And in two years time, you're gonna have nuclear reactors powering AI chips. And it's kind of dystopian in a way because nuclear reactors powering data centers, I mean, if you would ask me three years from now, uh, ago if this could be a reality, I would have said, no way in hell. So Yeah, we could use better energy uh, elsewhere. But no, it's it's exciting to watch it all play out. I know you've got other things to do. Uh, Greg Osiri, the co-founder of Akash, by the way, we didn't even talk about it, but you know, appreciate your support for what we're building here at Coinage. Uh, appreciate you being involved and excited that we run a validator on Akash as well that people can, can stake with. Yeah, it. these guys are doing an amazing job with validating Akash, obviously spreading the word, uh, not only about Akash, but I think about a decentralization as a whole, you want a high tier, top tier publication like Coinage. So please consider delegating yes. your Akash tokens to Coinage Validator uh, and support their incredible work. Yeah, Yo, thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. That's going to do it for us at Mainnet. I know you got to run. Thanks again, man. Appreciate, appreciate it. it.